So what is anti-colonialism? Who is anti-colonial force? It is all these people's uh, demand for to be included in uh, the, uh, the coming polity, the political shape, uh, Pule onwards right down to the uh, Achyutan and uh, Santram, BA and all those people. They started and the, and the British could not resist them. They, they, they had to give all their dues. After giving them all their dues, then the British sees that there is nothing in their hands to take home. Is that there is no use of colonialism. You take this bloody colony and go. So who is anti-colonial? You see, many of these things we keep on, you know, I mean, this is the problem with the many of the institutionalized academics, no? We just, the dominance. Keep repeating the dominance narrative. Dominant narratives as, uh, as uh, knowledge narratives. Critical, where is criticality? Where? Nationalism as a political ideology and also a, a political movement is only a reassertion. Reassertion. Assertion hmm. of the colonially valorized and collusively hailed, celebrated, uh, uh, what do you call? Uh, Brahminical uh, India. Uh, Brahminical notion of India, Brahminical notion of society, Brahminical way and view of life. In, no, for the last okay. few years, I have been struggling to uh, to present Periyar's writings in English. Hmm. You uh, are, you are? Periyar's writings okay. in, Engle, in, in English. Okay. You see, it's long ago when I was in the corridors of sociology hmm. department, one professor challenged me. Hmm. You said Periyar, Periyar, you people are saying, give me something, Periyar. I couldn't give anything. That was the way I started that Periyar on Islam I started. Mm. I have read it, sir. Ah, here, thank you. <laughs> I've been doing that so far. It's nearing its end. Maybe the next year or so I come up with half of what Periyar spoke. So you are yes, bringing uh, a volume, collected writings of Periyar edited by you? Um, uh, translated, introduced and edited, annotated by so me. So it is from Tamil? From Tamil, 10 volumes will be roughly. Uh, my name is Abhay Kumar and uh, I have studied at JNU. I have done my PhD at history department. And today I am going to discuss many issues with uh, another JNU friend. He is uh, our senior, J. Alusius. J. Alusius studied at JNU at sociology department and he is uh, not only uh, a genuine student, a scholar, a writer, but a uh, great thinker of our time. And uh, he looks at issues from Ambedkar's point of view, from marginalized point of view, and he carry forward the legacy of Fule, Ambedkar and Periyar. Today, I met Alusia sir and uh, you have read his book uh, Nation uh, and Nationalism and also several pamphlets uh, which are being published by Critical Quest. So you are all aware of his writing and today in JNU's library canteen I met Alusia sir and I requested him sir I would like to interview you because there are many scholars, students, activists who would be very eager to learn from you more and more about politics, economy, society and history. So he said, I'll talk to you after 10 minutes after the lunch. Sir, uh, first of all, you were a student here. Could you say something about your JNU days? Well, I did my MPhil in JNU and uh, it was a... Uh, on the whole, a pleasant experience, uh, also learning uh, how the JNU system works and uh, what are the tricks. All that I learned from those students who did their MA here, because JNU means it is MA. Uh, the others come later and then go back and all that. And But then JNU did give me a lot of uh, uh, exposure, a lot of exposure and uh, uh, made me think critically. Uh, of course, I, I have to say, tell you also that I didn't come as a, just like any other student. I came after several years of uh, field work. I'm not field work actually, activist uh, uh, kind of thing in uh, Jharkhand. You were earlier uh, working as activist in Jharkhand? Activist in Jharkhand. Uh, Jharkhand, uh, near Jamshedpur, Chaibasa and all that. So, I, which I consider my, my domicile because the best, uh, best uh, years of my life were spent there. Okay. You see? Uh, 
in the course of my activism i came up with a lot of problems and questions and so on and so forth so i thought i'll take a few years off and then go and study those problems and so on so that i came and landed in uh, 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 jnu and jnu did uh, give me a lot of uh, uh, thing with all there are a lot of problems with jnu which everybody knows and speaks about them but there is with this all that is said and done there has been some some scope for those who want to pursue on their own yes i was true is born in tamil nadu but then my conscious life was spent outside tamil nadu particularly in jharkhand which area sir in jharkhand is uh, the whole whole area whole oh, tribal okay. area yes, yes. jamshedpur chaibasa kolhan and all that uh, chakradarpur and all that okay. so man i i am more uh, kind of uh, in sentiment aligned with those places rather than uh, tamil nadu of course so you, tamil nadu so you are more jharkhand yeah you could say that you could say that but then now i am back in tamil nadu okay now and after so many years of uh, gap in between try to recover my so called roots i don't believe in those roots and so on where you are committed where you find some ideological struggle and that is your home so friends this is the beauty of uh, this country that uh, you are born at one places you have studied at another places you learnt many things and then you move from one place to another place and you learn uh, a lot many things sir when you came to jnu you took your admission at sociology center which is formally known as c triple s and uh, your mphil work was on let's say gandhian movement and anti caste movement and particularly you focus on uh let's say 1920s 30s and 40s so it was uh, both sociological and historical work so how did you get to uh, know that uh, you should uh, work on that topic how did that topic come to your mind you see all all the time even while i working in jharkhand among the people uh, my concern has always been the the macro reality micro reality macro yes sir. the larger reality yes sir. Uh, which is not easily perceptible for a positivist type of research yes. for field work and then survey research and so on mm-hmm. what eludes all this is a larger reality but the larger reality is a is a very compelling reality mm-hmm. the larger reality in everywhere but in particularly in, in the indian context it uh, it uh, has its own compulsions and so on in fact my problems with the with the jharkhand area while i was working was there is something that is in the macro historical and macro which sort of imposes itself on the micro and the local and all that kind of thing so i was sort of ready to reflect upon and read upon and then investigate how the macro reality then obviously i landed in a in a thing unless we kind of investigate how this uh, modern india emerged or did not emerge or partially emerged mm. that is unless that is grasped Uh, you will not be able to understand why and how the local and the regional and also the the micro are so much distorted so much distorted uh, so that is why I, that, that was the kind of thing i was ready with already when i came and joined the sociology department here and uh, which had a good introduction on uh, ethnicity nationalism and so on and so forth mm. then after that I, i i started saying thinking that i will do my uh, what do you call uh, review of literature on nation and nationalism and so on mm. and after that i'll launch if necessary uh, some study on tamil nadu emergence of tamil nadu and all that mm. but then this itself in turned out into be a something uh, huge and something more uh, ambitious than i uh, had earlier planned mm. uh, so in fact it is uh, it is what you call uh, uh, something there is some problem with the way india emerged in modernity mm. uh, in modern times uh, so i went after that mm. red and red and red and red many people who still remember me in the in the campus here they think this is a guy who used to early morning get up and then go and pack his lunch from the brahmaputra hostel and rush to the 615 to to tinmurthy library and sit for the whole day and come back that monk like fellow <laughs> no that that's what i remember that's what i was i was i mean i said this is uh, every day in the time i spend in uh, in delhi is uh, very costly and very precious so i should make use of the time so it's a ferocious reader and, uh, and so sir who were the people who influence you in uh, 
let's say formulating the topic or uh, or as far as uh, research methodology is concerned ambedkar is of course one of them but uh, would you like to say some uh, more uh, important thinkers no, writers I, actually you see it is difficult to point out i mean uh, uh, point out easier the, the the solid foundation for me had been always been the the whole tribal people with whom i worked is in jai in jharkhand i had all all the time i been thinking with the perspective okay now i am they are teaching me in the classroom this and this how will i be able to translate these things to my people there in the villages there how will they react will they understand it will they try to understand it and so on i always came up with the idea that they have something to say which they have never said they are not articulate they are not they don't they have not learned the idiom of the the middle class of people in this country and so on so the the solid base i had i had from there of course um, after that after that we had uh, uh, incidentally i did my ma in the philippines okay. in the philippines uh, where i learned i was introduced to what is called critical social science okay. Okay. Uh, critical social science uh, some introduction to that and so on and then when i came back here uh, it is mainly reading reading all kinds of things and uh, uh, particularly historical uh, things of different regions and so on and so forth from beginning i mean as, as you said ambedkar definitely periyar very i had not read much of periyar and ambedkar at that time when i wrote my uh, nationalism book uh it is only what i had to write on so i i went back to refer to what these people have said on that and so on and so forth i found one thing is this common thread along all along mm. of course the the one inspiration uh, which i keep coming back was uh, ranajit guha's uh, you know i mean i'm sure most of you have read yes. the uh, the of, uh, the founder of subaltern studies subaltern studies. studies but more than the subaltern studies as such the first volume what is it that inspired you somehow couple of lines only yes couple of lines on see somehow the the nationalist uh, history the history of elites uh history the nationalist forces failed to yes. uh, to hegemonize include and taking in the the rest of the country and so on that uh, in fact my entire the, the nationalism thesis is uh, explanation of that only yes which uh, ranajit guha himself may not agree to mm-hmm. but that is his problem my 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 inspiration was from there mm-hmm. and uh, so with that once that, that that thing was there then i found reading reading became very meaningful and uh, selective and purposive is it guiding me through all this kind of uh, things there is something negative at uh, at the macro historical and uh, sociological level in this country mm-hmm. rather than uh, you know finding fault with this is gone wrong that is gone wrong certain things are not working of course they are not working so many things are not working is it you are sir you don't take up this cause that cause there are thousand and one cause in this country and which you, then what suddenly i found was there is something connecting all these problems and all that mm-hmm. and that's what that inspired me to, to pursue my reading but huh? sir you have said that uh, uh your focus is to uh bring the larger picture uh to the uh, to to the readers but the by the time you were coming to universities and writing your thesis i think at that time cambridge university was uh, also regaining its strength and it was becoming very popular and particularly people like anil sin and galagar they were more talking about localities uh, micro uh, small uh, events and uh, subaltern studies you have already mentioned that uh, ranajit gua influence is there on you so uh, so e- am i correct to say that uh, you went against the dominant trend of the time what is the dominant trend of the time it was basically what uh, what we consider today the nationalist uh, trend is a nationalist trend cambridge uh, the um, uh, historiography you mentioned you see at that time they had crossed that time bar for keeping the documents mm. 
in the archives there is some regulation that for so that many years that should not be uh, made available to people mm -hmm. so that time was time was passed mm -hmm. so they would flow I mean, throw open the the, the archives mm -hmm. so the plethora of studies came for all of them to study what has been the inner side of the working of the mm -hmm. the raj the british raj and so on so they came up with a lot of things and so on they said one of the thing was how how uh, unrelated these so called nationalist forces were with what was going on in the ground and the various yes. internal fights that was going on and all that kind of thing mm. in fact whatever i have put in in my uh, in my thesis mm. is another way of saying was done by cambridge studies yeah there was not a development that was uh, inclusive mm. taking the mass along or speaking for the masses and articulating their concern etc that was a kind of uh, mm -hmm. there was a, like there was all you see there are several there was also a group of uh, um, uh, uh, set of uh, writings known as uh, earlier uh, bureaucrats writings because many of the british bureaucrats are also writers yes. writers and authors and so on they also pinched holes in the nationalist thesis and so many times and so on of course most of these things today we write off saying that either orientalism or uh, or some other kind of vested interests and so on and so forth but then they they are all saying the same thing they are all saying the same thing curiously what my own uh, kind of contribution to the whole thing is what this uh, today whom we call subaltern groups mm. across the country mm. and uh, they are all not related to one another another by either by religion or by language or by culture mm. they were all saying the same thing from narayana guru in uh, kerala mm. and then achutanand in uh, in uh, kanpur and up ah. jingyasu in uh, in uh, lucknow and allahabad mm. santram ba in lahore and all that they are already saying the saying the same thing that the, the day to day concern of the masses of people about education employment political representation the economic well being and all that were simply left off by these people whose ideas of history geography uh, and anthropology etc etc the whole range of knowledge about this subcontinent have been shaped by whom they call orientalism hmm. orientalism hmm. so the india these people came up with nothing to do with the, with the lived reality or the historically evolved the realities of different regions in different places hmm. that is why in a combination of all that hmm. i put i the advantage was that i am from uh, sociology hmm. you see the the question was that uh, people talk about urbanization no mm. i attended several conferences of urbanization when i was teaching in uh, uh, when i was studying in jamia mm. you were uh, once uh, uh, alma mater yes uh, there was a huge uh, conference on urbanization people are talking about the uh, alhabad how it came out uh, lucknow it came out and all that as a sociologist i raised the question sir sir what is urbanization Huh. said so how do you differentiate from uh, rural realities and all that is by the existence of some huge buildings and uh, things like that or the attitude and the mentality and the social relationship is a change in between people living in a rural area and an urban area of course they immediately no 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 you don't bring in complicated things and then you know i mean uh, we are all you know how how lucknow grew uh, and all that I mean, it's okay then now the it was the same problem even in other uh, seminars also you see the history goes in one way describing nationalism take for granted what is nationalism is what people call themselves nationalists they are the nationalists you see what is the nationalist movement that movement which called itself a national nationalist movement is a national but i am from a sociology so what is a nation what is nationalism does it come up to the level of definition of this and all that what if it doesn't satisfy any other criteria of nation and nationalism we study in sociology what do you call that a nationalism you see when you introduce that then i read there are there are there have been groups of people as i said from uh, kerala to uh, to lahore and um, to banaras and so on people are aspiring for a different reality different something new has come to the subcontinent and we are aspiring to be part of that participate in that share in the profit the benefits and the privileges and so on so forth and what have they to do with the people who are talking about nationalism and so on and they find complete dichotomy
complete dichotomy. So that I put together, where is the nation and where is the nationalism? Nationalism seems to be against a nation, emerging nation. Mm. So all that kind of became constituted that kind of thing. So that eventually turned up to be what we call historical sociology. Uh, historical sociology of uh, the uh, India subcontinent's emergence in modern times seen from the point of view not so much from the subaltern point of view that I would like to point out. Mine is not a, uh, exercise in subaltern uh, sociology. Subaltern sociology benefits enormously from what I have done and all that. I, have, I, I, I myself was struggling from subaltern thing. That, that is no point. But the main point is, is part of critical theory. Yes. Is part of critical theory. If you say you are a nation, you have to have this, 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 this. But I am not a mainly spokesperson of uh, the subaltern groups. Hmm. I happen to be that. That's good. But this is more, you see, otherwise what happens in the today's academics, institutionalized as it is, after having spoken about the nationalism point of view and all that kind of blah, blah, blah and all that, call somebody to speak on subaltern perspective. As though these things have nothing to do on what went before and these people have a very special point of view and they have something as an appendage or something added to this. No, I destabilize the whole thing. Your knowledge is not knowledge, it's pure power. Your power is being projected as knowledge. Hmm. Now that is the inner agenda of the subaltern people also. But now make a subaltern groups as a special point of view and then that will be called upon at the end of every seminar to speak on. And that I am against it. Yet I am this. So your uh, argument is that in a seminar what you do generally, you hold some topics on Dalit and Bahujan and minorities and then you discuss rest of the issues from a very different point of view. So what is called the normal? Yes. What is called the so, the, the so maybe if there are eight sessions, so seven or six sessions would be the discussion of normal thing. Normal. And thing. one or two uh, session would be the discussion of subaltern. Of subaltern perspective. Uh, they call those call those people men. So that there uh. should be a piece, something like that. But <laughs> your <laughs> argument is that you look at each and everything from critical point of view. Point of view, yes. and then suggest it, it is not what it ought to be. Yes. So the subaltern perspective should not be applied to only Dalit, but it should also be applied to economy and politics. Politics and the, in the mainstream, dominant stream or whatever be the, that of the elite and then destabilize them, they are, they are not what they pretend to be. Yes. So destabilizing hegemony. Sir, we have also heard these stories from our seniors. We were not there at your time that uh, while you were doing your research as JNU, which is otherwise known as very progressive and very liberal institutes. We have heard this story that at that time, uh, a lot of hurdles were created uh, f uh, as far as uh, the successful submissions of your PhD, as far as your MP work is concerned. Would you like to say something because, because, because people should know that you have also suffered in JNU, which is otherwise known as, let's say, the great place for research and academic work. No, no, uh, on that I am uh, sorry to say uh, something different, I mean it, uh, it has not been, uh, nobody interfered with what I uh, did. I had a very, very good, uh, uh, what do you call him, a supervisor, yes. supervisor, very appreciative and so on, though he totally disagreed with the what, whatever I wrote, mm -hmm. he, he was academic enough mm -hmm. and also a gentlemanly enough to say that you have destabilized all my beliefs and uh, so far held values mm -hmm. but then your, uh, your research is good. He said yeah. you, yes, your yes, research of course, is good. Yes, yes. Research is, I, because I asked, he said if you find something wrong in my methodology, in my way of going about, no you are, you are correct, you are correct but in my, you, only you have demolished my value system. Uh, he said, yes, sir that I can't help it that. Is this, that's your, your uh, problem and all that. So sir you are saying that we should get ourselves corrected you, your supervisor at a sociology center in JNU, although he was not agreeing to your conclusion, but he said that you have every right and you have followed the correct methodology, you are justified. Yes, I must say that uh, uh, thing in thanks to uh, Professor Abhijit Patak. Yes. Huh? 
uh, he has been very uh, uh, very gentlemanly and very kind of uh, uh, reading regularly whatever i wrote and then uh, uh, asking questions clarifications etc but never interfered with whatever i had to say sir uh, abhijit patel professor abhijit patel we have also attended his class uh, he appreciate a lot many things of gandhi and in this country uh, questioning gandhi particularly his uh, nationalist credential is very very difficult so how could you become sir so bold to questions gandhi and look at gandhian perspective from caste point of view and to say that everything which was happening after the arrival of gandhi in indian politics was not great you see i i that's why like, as i mentioned to you earlier i was not uh, like a uh, like a normal student no you know finishing uh, one uh, ba ma and then come here and all that that means in other words i didn't grow into the uh, socializing process of the academics you know institutionalized academics in india mm. all what i had was the books in front of me the ideas of gandhi and the ideas of nehru ideas of so many people and all that kind of thing and i had the the whatever i learnt about critical sociology and whatever they taught earlier and later and all that so with that only i judged i i have i have not grown into an uh, into an institutionalized sociology to which i am be- become i become beholden to so many persons um, academic protocols academic kind of uh, deferences etc etc so i i just said what i uh, felt it is uh, uh, is the right thing what follows from the logic of my premises okay now incidentally this um, in my examination m phil uh, viva examination uh, the examiner did the mention uh, kunti have spared uh, mr gandhi <laughs> mahatma gandhi sir tell me with where i have gone wrong and where i have something i'll i'll try to reread and all that no there isn't anything particular but then you know somehow i feel that and i can't help it sir and all that no that was the only kind of a thing in one to tell you how it was slightly difficult different in i think in tinmurti i had this experience i i was i'm a member of tinmurti library i went uh, so in the tinmurti arrangement of books is according to the uh, standard and the mainstream knowledge of uh, uh, what do you call disciplines so, so when you enter tinmurti library gandhi books gandhi will, books we will meet first yes gandhi books nehru books and then the, the nationalism yes okay and sociology books are behind somewhere in yes. uh, in yes. uh, corner yes so so at that so, time, so readers will first meet the books written by gandhi and nehru and books written by a socialist and other people from the marginalized social, section sociologists ah. uh, social movements ah. tribal movements low caste movements and all that and somewhere else yes yes, yes. okay at that time we had a uh, what do you call a librarian yes. a totally dedicated lady uh, to the library well being our library yes. so she found me going into the tracks here in uh, in the nationalism section and also going into the, the sections behind in a sociology section mm. she felt something suspicious what this guy is going here and going that now what are what are you doing sir madam i am doing research what is your topic mm. uh, madam nationalism he said they are here <laughs> so limit yourself uh, to this why are you going there man i am from sociology department so what so oh, even the librarian was disciplining you see yeah you see that she these people grow in the in the way the disciplines are divided and so on no? mm-hmm. so then i said then i said i had to check your references and all that then she took me to the room and then said who introduced you and all that kind of thing and so on mm-hmm. uh, then she said no, this is what i am studying madam i mean uh, anyway you take care I mean uh, the books are very precious here mm-hmm. you know at that time people used to to snatch away pages from the books and all that is it that is a minor thing but give me an insight how people you know mean how discipline knowledge is disciplined mm-hmm. by kind of system institutionalization in nationalism is there there it's not nationalism that is what i try to bring that nation is there nationalism is here yeah. uh, that's a kind of uh, that's an incident otherwise my i had i didn't have any any, any bad uh, experience about uh, uh jnu
sir uh, you say that uh, your supervisor was very good very friendly and you had no such problem even your external has said that you could have spared gandhi but you are uh, you were uh, awarded the degree successfully but there is also an assumption that since you have criticized gandhi you are a very critical scholar that is why the place like jnu has not given you a space where you should have taught no no i i wouldn't uh, then that that point of view may have some may have some 10% no sir you speak the truth you speak the no, truth no no i speak the truth yeah. i speak the truth there was i had a technical problem no i have not a phd you see people whom they wanted they appointed so do uh, do jnu people of fear your writing sir that's not true only of jnu uh-huh. no i think they they lot of appreciation was there for my work but in a lower level but he said i they didn't co-opt me to be part of the faculty so and the pd sir i don't know i don't know i but I but, but, but but it may be the uh, the case I, uh, sir you are right i am and friends, also oh, friends friends i would like to add here when olusius sir wrote his uh, enfield thesis uh, nationalism without a nation that thesis that dissertation was published by oxford university press that is one of the best publishing houses not only in india but across the globe and his work has been read reread his book has been printed printed for several several times and it is still getting printed and when i joined jnu uh in ma courses my teacher professor nibedita menan she gave me the reading of olusius sir book in uh, uh nationalism without a nation two chapters we read it and where she aware professor has criticized gandhi that the arrival of gandhi and movement was not something uh, which should be celebrated by let's say the marginalized sections because entry of gandhi has somehow Uh, eroded uh, the concerns of uh, let's say dalits and bahujan and the marginalized community so alusius sir is not a small person i think he is read by thousands and thousands and millions of people he has got lot of influence sir i must accept this fact you deserve more than any okay, other person i think you are slightly exaggerating uh, the you deserve more than any other person sir I, i don't know you see that the conclusion i have arrived at systematically through sociology mm. is the same conclusion mm. arrived at by several other scholars before me and even during my time or even later mm. who have been studying from individual uh, case studies individual case studies for example taking the situation of children taking the situation of women mm. taking the situation of labor mm. taking the situation of several other kind of tribals and all that mm. they come to the same conclusion mm. but my only distinction was that i had tra- arrived at sociologically in a systematic way put it there then it looks very kind of you know i mean uh, threatening kind of uh, thing like that mm. it otherwise it is the same as very many progressive writers have written in many many other uh, specializing in uh, women studies and tribal studies and so on and so forth mm. now the conclusions that i ruthlessly derived at from there is also part of the reason why i was not part of the this academic uh, uh let us say uh, social habitat, social habitat uh, habitat, uh, habitat. Uh, that's right that's a uh, the ecosystem uh, what ecosystem. The, today these people uh. talk about ecosystem why not because for uh, only ecosystem yeah. poisonous ecosystem uh, i yeah. i not so I, i for me i i because another thing i will tell you yeah. i do not know who is who in academic uh, world okay because many of them is studying 5 years 6 years many people who study 5 years 6 years 10 years in jnu they would know who is the uncle of who who is the who is the daughter in law of who and uh, all that i said i don't know all this Achha, okay sir okay sir <laughs> you have written your dissertation your book is there uh, it is the story of 20 years back i am now uh, r- uh, asking these questions again there are two ways to look at gandhi and ambedkar one would one way would be that gandhi was great 
another way would be that ambedkar was great there are also some other scholars sir ramchandar guha and other who try to say that oh gandhi and ambedkar both were friends both were concerned about the society and if i remember correctly i think it is ramchandar guha's argument that untouchability or maybe the caste system or maybe untouchability was first taken up by gandhi in nationalist movement gandhi in the, in the all those studies comparing uh, gandhi and uh, ambedkar and all that kind of thing mm. there is a certain point of view which uh, many of those people who directly or indirectly mm. uh, what do you call valorize gandhi is that there is a certain social point of view uh, which escape uh, perspectives coming from ambedkar and others mm. which are which are uh, supposed to be more legalistic and things like that mm. with all th- but then with all that said and done gandhi was unambiguously for reasserting the same old uh, uh, varnashrama dharmic uh, mm. thing mm. not the same old varnashrama this is the same old varnashrama dharma mm. what is normally said same old varnashrama dharma mm. was not as ruthless hmm. as the varnashrama dharma that came to be valorized to worked out elaborately enabled and ennobled by through the the years of colonialism and uh, subsequent nationalism and so on hmm. gandhi was trying to sort of reach out to those kind of uh, period ah huh? where uh, for example the varnashrama dharma in uh, in the bhojpuria region and all that mm. people constantly say that it, there are there is no brahmin in these celebrations there is no brahmin in that that kind of thing and all that but now everything is coming back and all that and many places we don't have brahmins in tamil nadu for example we find suddenly the all these brahmins who were till yesterday begging around the place now become judges and all that in some places even today there are not very many brahmins and then people live their normal tribal life and all that kind and there are if there is a, there is so there was caste there was mm. no caste also in many places and there is anti caste also mm. now everything seems to have collapsed into one kind of caste casteism mm. and all that that came mainly after mr gandhi's uh, kind of thing and uh, that i my my conclusion what i wrote some 20 years ago in my book i am more and more convinced of that mm. today it is working out the same logic mm. much more uh, ruthlessly mm. than it was some 20 years ago where is little bit of we have to search for we have to understand you have to uh, trace out things and all that but now it is for everybody to see and all that sir uh, you have uh, criticized gandhi and his nationalism but i know that in mainstream uh, academic writings there has been an allegation which is put on dalit bahujan thinkers that they supported colonialism they were uh, uh, with the british empire and so uh, we have this kind of the criticism where uh, there is a tendency to delegitimize and i have also read your writing on nationalism and i feel i feel this is my reading that you are more critical of orientalist uh, scholars on india while i get this feeling that you are more appreciative of the utilitarian thinkers who came later so what about this overall charge that uh, uh, the dalit bahujan thinkers were apologists of colonial rule sir you see many of these uh, kind of things i am uh, i have my rethinking uh, huh? it is the guys who were colonized who were thoroughly colonized are ruling us now mm-hmm. and those who were didn't get colonized are those who guys resisted colonialism where they were they are where they were okay. <laughs> so whether colonialism is good or bad who I mean who came to rule after the colonial big guys left those who got thoroughly colonized are the guys who so what is what, what colonialism you are talking about what anti colonialism you are talking about and leaving aside that question more, more over and above mm. it is colonialism that introduced modernity in india mm. the with all said and done it is colonial rulers who introduced modernity <laughs> Uh, the notions of uh, equality the uh, french revolution democracy etc etc and that you cannot escape mm. escape is it that that is that is how it is that towards that all this uh, beginning with the pule ayotidasar 
Priya and Ambedkar are all sensitive to. Times have changed. Times have become uh, scientific uh, age, empirical verification, democracy, and secularism, etc. And that they were sensitive. To that they were sensitive. They are not sensitive to the their ruling, their colonial rulers. And it is not true at all that these fellows are anti-colonial. I, I deny that. That all these fellows who later on now now they are mainly now. In the post-colonial period, they are talking about anti-colonialism. They were not anti-colonial. They are, they were they they swallowed up, hogged up everything the colonizers said and did. Hmm. Is it, so, so when does a colony loses its uh, colonial value? What is a colony uh, colonialism? What is the essence of colonialism? The colonizers are able to take home a plenty on their hands. When would that be possible for the colonizers to take plenty of uh, surplus from here? It's only when the mass of people have not come up, risen to the level of understanding, appropriating those benefits. Then people started demanding, where is my share, where is your share, where is his share? Everybody share, after giving everybody share, that fellow looks at, I don't have anything. If fellows, you take this bloody country, you yourselves and run, then, then they run away. So what is anti-colonialism? Who is anti-colonial force? It is all these people's uh, demand for to be included in uh, the, uh, the coming polity, the political shape, uh, Pule onwards right down to the uh, Achyutan and uh, Santram, BA and all those people. They started, and the, and the British could not resist them. They, they, they had to give all their dues. After giving them all their dues, then the British sees that there is nothing in their hands to take home. Is that there is no use of colonialism. You take this bloody colony and go. So who is anti-colonial? You see, many of these things we keep on, you know, I mean, this is the problem with the many of the institutionalized academics, you know, we just, the dominance, keep repeating the dominance narrative. dominant narratives as, uh, as uh, knowledge narratives, critical, where is criticality, where do we struggle for all this and then establish kind of thing. So all those discourses I, 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 I I'm sorry, I couldn't find much time subsequently. Uh, to elaborate these things in uh, many other uh, books that should be should have been coming after that and all that, but I have my own priorities to do that, so I didn't. Uh, Sir, hmm. India is celebrating its uh, Amrit Kal uh, Independence Day celebration. I think we have achieved 70 and 80 years of independence. Constitutions has been working for so so many years since it was first adopted. So it is all being uh, celebrated. India is biggest democracy. Even we have got a prime minister who. Be belongs to let's say backward cast. Uh, given all those great great achievements which our media uh, is celebrating, sir you come from south, do you think that our polity has been uh, federal enough, I think liberal enough to incorporate and give appropriate places to Dalit Bahujan writers who particularly come from the south like Periyar and I think Phule. And uh, really, uh, you see that one problem is a very serious problem in the ca in the case of uh, Indian uh, subcontinent, mm -hmm. diversity. Yes, diversity. This diversity is not like uh, you know, I mean, American diversity where you are uh, Hispanic, I am uh, India, he is uh, from Africa. Our our diversity has this, uh, this unavoidable nexus of language and territory. You know, you take a taxi uh, and then go for 200-300 miles, mm -hmm. that is all Bhojpuriya speaking people. Mm -hmm. After that starts what? Avadi speaking people start, you see? This is, uh, this is something like European uh, diversity. Mm -hmm. huh? Now, from the fact Europe was one continent, having one Christianity as one uh, religion and all that, it entered into modernity into many nation states. Mm -hmm based on language and all that kind of thing. But in India, ulta ho gaya. It was many nation, many uh, kingdoms, 56 kingdoms in the according to old uh, sayings and all that. In the entry into the modern times, it became one. Yeah. And there are many religions earlier, now it became one. Yeah. Hinduism as a part of the religion and all that. The, pro the point I am making is, uh, it is Hindu religion. It is a Hindi language. It is Hindustan. None of them are true. None of them are true. Na? 
Hindi doesn't refer to a language. Hindi refers to some 50 languages. But Puri is also one of them. Ah, yes, yes. Yeah. You are supposed to be mutually intelligible to a Rajasthani uh, speaking. And I, till today, I speak to my mother in Bhojpuri. Bhojpuri? If, yes. You see, uh, our region is called Hindi region. <laughs> <laughs> so that the creation of this kind of mega entities and all that, I mean, uh, all these are not workable, sustainable <laughs> developments and all that. Nah. The, these are uh, the, uh, equality for uh, to which all these uh, ideologues of social equality, you know, the, the number of periyar and all that you get there. No? They have a very intricate connection with the diversity. Historically, if you see, diversity in the Indian subcontinent, diversity of developing various regions and the languages, religions, cults, uh, and uh, so in the what do you call uh, uh, local religions and kinship systems etc etc have a direct relation to struggle towards equality so the equality and diversity is a, is a two uh, two sides of so the same, same coin, coin struggling now that whole thing has been negated and we are saying we are in a different plane altogether the India of uh, the orientalist, colonialist, uh, nationalist produced something and all these people are supposed to be backwards. Have you found any country where 85 percent of the people are called backward? Why well, every country has uh, backward people, no? some 5 percent, 10 percent, socially backward. What is this meaning? The country is a backward, country is a migrant country eh? for labor, labor migration. Okay. You see, they, then they will say that this is not, you are talking about the language based uh, uh, nations of Europe and all that. But that's what you are trying to make India out of single language, single leader, single uh, language, religion, single everything, mm, but not single caste. You see? So this is a kind of a very kind of a very complex and extremely very kind of perverted situation we got ourselves into and this complexity and perversion is becoming very very clear as days go on, days go on. So it, uh, that first my study was the nationalism without a nation, I analyzed this only from the point of view of equality. Equality has been completely denied because our nation is a unique nation, it should not be like any other nation. So what means Sanatana Dharma will be the dominant uh, position in this kind of thing? Is Sanatana Dharma means caste? No, 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 you are misunderstanding Sanatana Dharma has nothing to do with today's caste, yesterday's caste was different and all that kind of thing. Now, we have another huge problem called diversity. How do you, you see for example, you go with the same technology you use in Madhya Pradesh, carry the technology to the Himalayan region. Aren't we today trapped with the Siliakara uh, tunnel, Joshi Mutt uh, sinking? Because it's a single technology way. Is that the Delhi bureaucrats decide what is there and all that, and so they carry it everywhere. And ONGC goes and drills in, uh, in the Himalayan region, and the whole thing sinks. Because that's what they know. They want, they are laying eight lane, eight lane uh, uh, roads in, uh, in the plains of uh, uh, UP and uh, Madhya Pradesh. The same thing they want to lay in uh, Kerala. Then it will become the only Kerala, there will be only road. There won't be Kerala, only road will be there. You know, these are, these are, our, our regions are so long developed, you know. These are thousands of years developed with so many variations and so on. For example, when I was struggling with the, in, uh, with the tribals in uh, uh, Jharkhand, they were being given by this uh, ration shop wheat, oil and uh, sugar. These three things which tribals don't eat. Yeah, because we are, we are not going to set up a fertilizer corporation, I mean food corporation for you. It's a central government uh, institution. So what do the, all these three items go only to the black marketing uh, in the tribal areas and so on. We cannot have something for what they want. You see? This is, a, you know, I can accumulate a lot of uh, instances like that. Just to say that diversity is so foundational for our uh, uh, Indian subcontinent. And what is the uh, abolition of caste in one region is not cannot be the same for another region. 
we can keep on talking abolition of caste abolition of caste it's like a sword of damocles no uh, windmills fighting windmills and so on so all these kind of things uh, the chanting has got no meaning no meaning no meaning at all it gives some employment for some people yes friends uh, olusia sir is so knowledgeable that i think one hour interview would not be complete but sir i am going to uh, end this uh, discussion for today for timing sir i have got three questions very briefly i would like to get your answer and then we'll stop it sir we have studied periyar okay periyar was such a important great uh, critical thinker who believed in idea of equality all types of equality man who believed in rationality who opposed all kinds of fanaticism and superstition why the central government or central agencies and central universities or particularly people in north india they don't want to discuss nationalism as a political ideology and also a, a political movement is only a reassertion reassertion assertion mm. of the colonially valorized and collusively hailed celebrated uh, uh, what do you call uh, brahmanical uh, india uh, brahmanical notion of india brahmanical notion of society brahmanical way and view of life brahmanical way and view of life you see this i got it validated i was because when i wrote my appeal thesis i was i am saying something uh, which uh, which is rather uh, uh, how do i say it everybody uh, intellectually i had this beautiful opportunity in my in my viva exam you know the presence of gp desh pandey yes gp gp desh pandey taught here in school of international studies phule is uh, phule is writing he has translated he is a close friend of manra manoranjan mohanty and he said uh, i mean uh, they both of them coming to sit for my viva uh, uh, and i was nervous and all that and uh, that is going on and all that manaranjan mohan he said a lot of good things about my thesis and all that he said uh, then i asked uh, uh, this gpd sir nationalism in india i i didn't complete the sentence he completed it for me is a reassertion of the same reassertion of, of the same, same. Yes. ah that that was enough for me enough certificate for me sir i was recently reading uh, max muller's uh, lectures which he gave at cambridge before is officer and he there is one very famous essay what india has taught us and in that book uh, in that lecture max muller never came to india never saw india with his own neck and eye he was praising hindus as a religious community like anything but he was calling mohammedans a fanatic and he was even the using mohammedan rule as a terror so you could understand that the colonial understanding had also created i think hindu muslim uh, binary and that binary was further now being used by let's say the hindu right for their political gain and again coming back to your point that nationalism is nothing but reassertion of the way india was being articulated the be the, the, the way india was being uh, projected by the orientalist think, uh, thinkers orientalist cum nationalist thinkers okay so sir uh, friends uh, you know it very well that there is a publication a small publication which is known as critical quest and when i was studying in jamia before coming to jnu sir's uh, partner uh, she was there and she was selling that uh, critical quest uh, sets and i got all those sets at that time in 2018 in 800 rupees and i must tell you i do not belong to lower caste i do not belong to let's say marginalized community i come from very much upper caste background and sir today if i understand periyar and today if I, if if i could appreciate ambedkar reading it is all because of the critical quest Thank you. because much of my brahmanical thinking and brahmanical way of articulation which i imbibed consciously unconsciously they were completely driven out by reading your books of so friends the critical quest book is important because it is very easy to read you can buy it for 30 rupees 40 rupees 50 rupees it is the brilliant idea to introduce cri- critical quest as a publication and the great thing about j alusia sir is that he had read 
एवरी लिटरेचर मार्क्सिज्म सोशलिज्म दलित बहुजन आइडियोलॉजी लिबरल क्रिटिकल थिंकिंग आई I I I much of Brahmanism by reading your book. I must appreciate it and I must acknowledge it. How could that great idea come to your mind, sir? You are revolutionizing public sphere. No, that uh, see that was core in the course of my in the course of my reading materials for uh, uh, writing my thesis, nationalism. I came to uh, uh, came across a number of small small writings of old. You, know, you see, olden days when the printing was new, and uh, and the so scattered, and the the subaltern groups of people were not empowered to go hi-fi and all that kind of thing. I have came across so many of them in the course of my writing uh, the nationalism when I was studying the movements, so what we call social movements in across the Indian subcontinent. As I learnt the ideology and the 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 dynamics. of indian uh, indian society i thought the same thing should be i should share it with a lot of so people. whatever we are reading through critical quest it is all because of the years of hard work and selection by professor by <laughs> malusia sir is a uh, I I found uh, I did try to do that because I found lot of like just like annihilation of caste by Ambedkar that is one obvious uh, example. There are hundreds and hundreds of people writing similar thrust. The the sameness of those thrust was what attracted me. Yes, and critical uh, thinking and looking at from marginalized point. Marginalized of point of view, and though people were all differentiated in in terms of religion, region. and language etc etc their aspiration to grasp modern uh, living and modernity itself was so astounding so i thought this should come and make a thing that uh, and sir uh, one thing i would like to say that generally a division is being created between marxism and social bahujan thinkers but that narrow understanding is not with uh, alusia sir because if you read critical quest you will find reading of marx and marx of uh, writing on culture is there i think uh, Uh, angels writing on religion is there yes, yes, yes. and then there are uh, scholars from marxist tradition from the liberal tradition from dalit bahujan thing uh, tradition so sir idea is that let's get knowledge wherever it exists for a better society am i right definitely, sir definitely 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 so you we see, should not be narrow in approach narrow in approach even ordinary persons walking in the streets they may have the wisdom in fact our india what we call so called india the indian subcontinent various communities and regions have survived because of the folk wisdom folk wisdom they are very deep saturated with the for years and years of experience and so on that's how they have been accommodating themselves adjusting themselves to life's hardships and problems and so on through folk wisdom and suddenly we find something is coming from somewhere and then we have established some uh, vertical criteria or the canons of knowledge only these things are valid and other things are not valid it's not true at all the distinction is between good evidence and bad evidence not between uh, uh, ordinary people's evidence or academic evidence so, so sir argument is sir that who is saying the right thing the right thing matters not from where it is coming yeah, from where it is coming the right thing can come from anywhere from coming from but coming but, from. but but in our society so if it's big person thing. says wrong thing then it is right is such a thinking that uh, wisdom can come from anywhere uh. was also in our various regions yes various But regions in the in terms of you know i mean folk uh, folklore folk tales and so on and so forth and buddha used pali language which was used by uh, yeah, common person common people ha huh, he did uh, not use sanskrit sir not only that he also said uh, preached that uh, dharma should, dhamma should be taught in the language of the peoples themselves yes, differently yes. enough and in buddha sangha i think women everybody was uh, welcome sir every everyone a so, true achievement yes you you became great by doing something not by being born in certain so, places so so dalit bahujan thinking is inclusion not exclusion sir last question what is your engagement these days i think you stay in delhi what are you are writing what you are reading no, for the last few years i have been struggling to uh, to present periyar's writings in english hmm. you uh, are you are periyar's writings okay. in english in, in english okay. is is long ago when i was in the corridors of sociology mm. department one professor challenged me mm. you said periyar periyar you people are saying give me something mm. periyar i couldn't give anything that was the way i started that periyar on islam i started mm. 
I have read it, sir. Ah, uh, here. Thank you. For <laughs> I've been doing that so far. It's nearing its end. Maybe in the next year or so, I should come up with half of what Periyar spoke. So you are yes, bringing a volume collected writing. So Periyar edited by you. Um, uh, translated, introduced, and edited, annotated by so me. So it is from Tamil. From Tamil, ten volumes will be roughly. Ten volumes. Ten volumes will be ten. Ten volumes. So it and is. And that is only half of what he spoke and wrote. Okay. So, <laughs> so if all collected works of Periyar would be translated, it would be around twenty to thirty. Twenty to thirty, thirty volumes easily. Hmm. So, sir, you have done wonderful thing, friends. I must tell you that today I feel completely enlightened. The person whose writing I have read for so many years, for more than one decade. the person whose writing i read in genuine my ma courses and the person whose uh, uh, publications i was aware of in my jamia days before coming to genu today i have got the opportunity many things he has said and uh, i think those are wonderful and profound words and we need many more such meetings to get to know what sir is thinking about and the great thing about uh, uh, olusia sir is, uh, is this and let me also sir summarize it that without institution and without institutional support if person is committed and if person is motivated and if person is being driven by the ideology of Uh, democratizing and uh, bringing social justice in society that persons can do great and i believe that professor olusia sir because of his writing many institutions and those who are sitting at big big centers they feared his work and that is why he was not accommodated but sir has produced something which even 100 professors cannot do it and this is sir your contribution i am really honored that you have given me time to talk thank you thank you thank you so much thank you very much